Good morning. This is going to be a good sermon because I couldn't get the sound right the last sermon, so everything is starting off pretty good. But. I am elated. I am elated. I am. Did I say I was elated? Last three months, I've been preaching to a computer <laughs> and posting stuff on Facebook, and it's difficult because I'm old, so I don't know the technology that well. But it is so good to physically be here with you and see all of your faces today. It's really a blessing. I'm trying not to get too comfortable because y'all know that the numbers are ticking up, so we're just going to pray that, that things keep working in the right direction. God, God's going to cover us, and I'm confident of that. We're talking about my people. We're in the book of Exodus, and you do know that. We've been going over this over the last several weeks. Lynn Wood started us out with the point of God rescuing his people through blood and through water, through the blood sacrifices of the animals as his people sacrificed, and the rescuing through the Red Sea, through the water, God rescued his people, moved them out of Egypt, and Eli covered us with the promise, God's promises, the covenant uh, a couple of weeks ago. If we do these things that God says, then God will take care of us. David came to us last week talking about God's presence, God's always with us, how he traveled in the desert with the Egyptians. He, they had the fire and they had the cloud that covered them, that protected them, and, and they carried the tabernacle with them and, along with the bones of Joseph, and God was always with them. And today, the symbol is the hourglass how God allowed his people to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So if you're a clock watcher, I brought the hourglass here, and I should be finished by the time that sand runs through. So uh, I don't want you to focus so much on this. I do want you to focus on the Word of God. When we talk about my people, the Hebrews were God's special people. He loved them. He protected them. He took care of them. Then, and actually, even today, God protects the people of Israel. He protects the Hebrews. So that's something to think about. Special people that were close to God. And uh, I, I went back over the services and the sermons that were preached the last couple of weeks to get some good points. And I noticed that, you know, Dave, um, Eli talked about Hayden, you know, being his little girl, special girl. And David put his his family up last week. So I had to put my people up today. I want you to meet my people. Uh, I was blessed actually to have uh, several of them at the first service. My grandkids are visiting this weekend, but these are my people. This is who God blessed me with to be the, the, the covering for this family. My queen Andrea is there. Um, and out of our union of 36 years, we were blessed with four children. This picture was taken a couple of years ago at my son Christopher's wedding. He's the, the one in the middle with the green suit. Uh, my beautiful daughter, Deanna, um, and this is for you, Eli. Deanna is 32 years old today. Uh, today's her birthday, and she's celebrating with us. Um, the love you have for Hayden, imagine after 32 years, it grows. It continues to grow. Um, my middle son, Mackenzie, who will be married uh, this coming uh, November here in this church, and my youngest son, Sam. And an extension of those people is uh, Deanna and her husband, Jeremy, uh, my two grandboys, Jameson and Jefferson, who are here this morning. Uh, Christopher's married to Jenny. They're up in New York right now. Pray for them being up in New York City. Uh, Mackenzie, the middle son, will be married this November to Samantha, who was here at the first service. And Sam has my third grandchild, three-month-old Gianni. I'm very proud of my people. They are close to me. They are special to me. And God has entrusted me with them to cover them because God modeled the situation that he's in to our own families. So the man being the head, the partnership with the wife, and then the family propagating. So enough about my particular family. I'm going to go back to God's people, and we're going to talk a little bit about this Exodus thing. 
And starting out in Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 through 18, it says, when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though it was the shortest route to the promised land. God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their mind and return to Egypt. So God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. So when I did a little research on that, it actually meant that they were in a battle formation for protection. And it stuck out to me after reading this many, many times is that, you know, we always talk about they were in the wilderness for 40 years, a bunch of dumb people that disobedient to God, you know, wandering around in the desert, wasted all of that time and finally got to the promised land. But I, this thing stuck out to me this time specifically because it said God led them in a roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And I said, yeah, okay. So it wasn't that they were so stupid, but God actually directed their path in a different direction than they could have gone. So for a visual, I included for you a map, a map of where Egypt was and the promised land was. And if you look at the dark black line, that's the straight line to where they should have gone. And if you look at the red line, that's where they actually spent 40 years traveling. Now, in a little bit of an explanation of that, you see where the red line starts to dip a little bit below the way of the Philistines, which is about the middle way of that black line. So God intentionally did not want them to go in that direction because it was dangerous for them. They were not a battle-ready nation. And God said, if you run into the Philistines this early into your journey, you're going to run into trouble. You might get scared. You might want to go back to Egypt. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you dip around there a little bit and take a different direction. But it turns out they kept dipping and they kept going in a different direction. And this trip actually should have taken them about uh, two weeks. <laughs> and it took, them, it took them 40 years, 40 years. Now, when I did a little bit more research, I was thinking because this was 600,000 men that were the children of Israel, which means that they probably had about 2 million people walking through this desert. This was no easy feat. When Pharaoh and his army actually chased them to and through the Red Sea, split the Red Sea, they walked through on dry land. In looking at the numbers, Pharaoh had 600 chariots following 2 million people. And I'm scratching my head saying, if they would have just turned around and started fighting, <laughs> they probably could have outnumbered them and beat them then. But they were so, you 400 years of oppression and slavery and crying out, and they were scared of these people. They're like, we got to get out of here. We got to get away from them. So they didn't want to turn around and fight, but God fought that battle from them, opened up the Red Sea, and thus they started on their journey through the wilderness for how many years? 40 years years. What did they do in the wilderness for 40 years outside of grumbling and complaining? The good side of this is wilderness and adversity builds character in us. So if you think about it, what they did for 40 years is they practiced a lifestyle of worship. I want you to think about the day in the life of the people of Israel. They had, to, they had to go through all types of ritualistic ceremonies. So they actually had to herd cattle because the cattle that they used actually were used for sacrifice. You know, what if I told my wife she had to go get up and, and, and you know, prepare the sheep for sacrifice? You know, you go kill that sheep and gut him open, and I'm going to bring him back and do all it. Stuff they had to do day-to-day -day preparing for the ritualistic things that they had to do to worship God. 24-7, their focus was on what do we need to do to honor God and worship God when we camp, you know, set up camp, prepare, break camp, go, go a little bit further. But every day 
that ritualistic aspect of worshiping God. So there are things you have to do to practice a lifestyle of worship. Because the lifestyle of worship that they practice, to me, as I read into it, this is called sanctification. It is a practice. It is a process that we all have to do to get ready for a lifestyle of worship. This is actually work. This is actually action. Some stuff you have to do to practice a lifestyle of worship. The God's people had to depart from Egypt. First of all, they had to get away from their oppressors. They were in slavery in Egypt for over 400 years. You think about it, they started out actually on top because Joseph, if you remember his story, 400 years ago, um, went through his own experience being sold, being jailed or whatever, and rose up to the top second in command of Egypt 400 years ago. This is how their people started out on top. But as time went on, the people grew and grew in number. And those in charge in Egypt said, you know what? These are not our people. They're growing so much in number. We need to do something about them to hold them down. So they started instituting the slavery and, and burdening the people of Egypt so much so that life became unbearable. And they cried out to God, and God allowed a way from, for them to depart Egypt. Not only did they depart Egypt, when they departed Egypt, they separated themselves from others because if you look at that trek in the desert, they were going around cities, going around other camps and people and places, and people were looking at, look at those stupid 200 million people, two, two million people walking around in the desert, sacrificing bulls and goats and carrying a tabernacle and carrying Joseph's bones through the desert. These is a weird bunch of people. <laughs> These people are strange. And not only that, they got a pillar of fire in front of them, and they got a cloud behind them. It's a weird group of people. But they were separate. They were different. They were different from others. It's a part of that practicing. They also had to depend on God's provision daily. There was no land for them to farm, nothing, you know, for them to do at that point. So they actually had to rely on God to take care of them all that 40 years. And you know, God actually did that. It says in the Bible that their sandals did not wear out. It says that their clothes did not wear out. Miraculous things that God did for these people. He fed them every day, manna coming from heaven so that they did not go hungry. He opened up a rock for them so they could have water. Depended on God every day. Lastly, they declared God's glory by representing him as a different, separated, sold-out people that worshiped God the other people didn't know about a, a, a one God. They worshiped, they worshiped a lot of other gods that didn't do nothing for them. But they worshiped this one God that protected them and took care of them. And their testimony is that they declared God's glory throughout their situation. From the time that the Red Sea parted, this was declaring God's glory to the pillar of fire, to the clouds, to all the miracles that he performed for them. The things that happened to them were declaring God's glory. So, to move it from the history of the Israelites to us, I thought about this thing, and I said, just like Eli did in, the, in, um, in his communion, this applies to us. The Old Testament always foretells what's happening in the New Testament. In Hebrews 13, 8 says, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we look at the people of Israel wandering, going through adversity, and we say, man, why did it take, you know, they could have done it in a couple of weeks. Why did it take them 40 years? And I have to ask the church, I have to ask you, my people who are the body of Christ, don't we do the same thing? We're kind of dumb. We kind of wander around sometimes in our life. So my lesson, if nothing else for you today, is this. 
We, we as the body of Christ, we as his people, we should practice a lifestyle of worship. We should practice sanctification. We should practice getting better. We should practice stepping out. We do not think about a lifestyle of worship because we have gotten so comfortable in our cushy chairs and our beautiful air-conditioned sanctuary that we think coming out here an hour every Sunday is a lifestyle of worship. That ain't a lifestyle of worship. What you do when you leave here shows whether or not you are actually practicing a lifestyle of worship. Now, it has gotten to the point, unfortunately, that the way society is now, we are unique coming to church every Sunday morning because when, when I was younger, most people used to go to church. Now people don't care about going to church. We say, come to my church, you'll have a good time. Why, why should I go to church? What's so different about your church? Why shouldn't I go to church down the street? Well, they, they, they teach something different, come to my church. Oh, well, y'all just divided as we are. How do I know who's right? How do I know who, who's wrong? They can only tell the difference by you practicing a lifestyle of worship outside of these four walls. How do we do that? Same way the Egyptians did. We got to depart from the status quo, and we got to separate ourselves from other people. People need to look at us and say, there is something different. There's something different about them. They don't do what everybody else does. They don't hang out with everybody else, but it looks like they're doing okay. How do they make it through a situation of COVID? How do they, how do they make it through a situation of, of racial unrest and things that are going on now? They're separate. Let, let's look at Romans. It tells us in Romans 12. This is our command in the New Testament. It says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. We don't have to get no lambs and bulls and goats or doves if we're poor. We can offer our bodies a living sacrifice because Jesus was that last lamb. He gave himself. He gave his blood. He made a covenant with us. And he has offered us an opportunity to start practicing this lifestyle of worship. We can only do that by separating ourselves. It says, don't copy the behavior and customers of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Depart, separate, change the way we think. Change the way I think? Yeah. Yeah. We've gone as a church, as the body of Christ, unfortunately, to try to assimilate with the world. We have unfortunately gotten cushy and comfortable, and we try to do what they do. They have influenced us. It should be the other way around. We should influence the world. I've looked at this situation of COVID. I've looked at this situation of racial unrest, and it has moved the church in different directions when all the time the church should have been the ones to move them in a different direction. We are not practicing a lifestyle of worship. It's okay. Y'all can clap. You should clap. What else should we do? Depend daily on God's provision. It says, Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. We forget about that because I don't have to really worry about what me and Miss Andrea are going to eat this afternoon. If we want to, we can go to a restaurant and pay somebody to feed us. Now, I'm not bragging. But we are very blessed here in America. We have luxuries and comforts that many people in the world do not have. There are other countries, other peoples that are starving. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. And we really don't have to think about that. Not only that, we like the Israelites. If we're having chicken this afternoon, we're going to be mad. I don't want no chicken. I want steak. Or I'm not a meat eater. I'm a vegan. 
And we have, we have a choice to make a selection of what we eat, and we complain because of the daily bread that God has given us. We have the audacity to complain like the people of Israel complain when God provided for them food out of the sky, and they said, I'm tired of this. <clears throat> yeah, we're just like them. And it causes us to waste time. And we wonder why we can't get from point A to point B because we are not practicing a lifestyle of worship. What else should we do to practice a lifestyle of worship? We should declare God's glory. 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 21. So we are Christ's ambassadors, it says. We are Christ's representatives God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we should be made right with God through Christ. We are Christ's spokesperson. We are his representatives. We are his ambassadors. When we go through a situation of adversity, do we represent Christ or do we grumble and complain? Oh, my God. I hate that we got to wear these masks. You know, people that wear masks are dumb. Well, you know, people that don't wear masks are dumb. Well, you know, this thing is all a government conspiracy. Oh, you know, this is, this is a real virus is going to hurt people. We're not even talking about God. We're arguing with each other over all of these situations. We're arguing over, over, over our, you know, the racial situation, which is why we're going to have this discussion tonight, because... The church should be the ones that represent Christ in everything because he is first, not our own opinions, not, not what we think is good or bad. Most of the time, we're a little bit off target anyway. But if we use this as our target, if we come out of this word, there's no way we can be wrong. I like to give a visual. I was talking about this situation of comfort and, and the church living in a cushy situation and being comfortable and I thought about this because all through the mumbling and grumbling, the people kept saying, gosh, we should have stayed in Egypt. At least we could have got some food every day. You know, we're out here in this desert, walking around. Moses don't know where he's going. Stuff is going on all crazy, you know. And I had to get a picture of this, so I want you all to understand what this is. This is a picture of the West Bank. This is Egypt on the left where all of the buildings green. This is, a, of course, a current picture. It ain't back then. And that's the desert on the right. So if you get an analogy of what happened, Moses is saying, we're going to leave this nice area over here in the green. We're going to cross the river. And we're going to go over there where it ain't nothing. We're going to go over in the wilderness. And people looking at Moses like, you're crazy. We ain't got no money. We ain't got no food. We ain't got no protection. And they just forgot that God allowed them crying to God. God, I want to be free. God, free us. God, freedom did a miracle. Walk through dry land. Linwood talked about it. Protected them. Miracle after miracle, they saw, and they're out in the wilderness. What does the wilderness do for us? What does adversity do for us? It is, puts us in a situation to where we need to look at God and God alone. We ran into, I preached the New Year's Eve sermon, uh, the New Year's sermon this year. We talk about 2020, everybody, 2020, we're going to be blessed this year. 2020 is going to be good. Every year we start out, man, this is going to be a new year. I'm going to do this. I got my plans. I got everything going on. It's going to be great. And bam, three months into 2020, this virus hits. Ah, oh, it ain't going to be that much. Next thing you know, 120,000 people are dead. Everybody wearing masks. Economy shuts down. Stupid thing. We get this COVID thing, and we're like, okay, we can beat this. We're all in this together. Then George Floyd gets shot, and then we, we're separate. <laughs> we're not in this together. How fickle is man? How much do we change and we turn around like the people of Israel? God's our protector. God's our stronghold. He's our representative. And then the next thing you know, a couple of days later, get mad because, man, I got this, this manna. I'm tired of this manna. 
man, you know, I want some meat. God sends down quail. He's like, I'm going to give you some meat. I'm just going to crush you with quail. And then, you know, then they complain. And then God sends the snakes. And the snakes back, oh, God, please save me. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Isn't that what we do? As a people of Christ... We should be the ones that are the influencers, not the ones that are influenced. So when everything hits us, when the adversity hits us, when we are put into a wilderness situation, we should be the ones that practice, continue, consistently practice daily worshiping God through whatever comes at us. Now, this is the other thing I thought about, the Egypt. Some of us in Egypt, and we like it because we're scared of going out in the wilderness. Listen to the missionaries give their testimony this morning. Talk about a wilderness. They're in a country that don't speak their language, that don't even know who Jesus is. 98% of those people do not know who God or Jesus is, and God told them, I need you to step out in the wilderness because I have a plan for you, and if you take it and you go through this, you're going to get to a promised land. Now, everybody's not gifted to go out and do that, but they obeyed God. What are some of you waiting for? God has gifted each of us differently to walk out in the wilderness because what we forget, we like it in Egypt. You know, I started working out a few you know, I mean, can't tell, but I started working out a few months ago. <laughs> With Marvin Mimi. And when I go work out, ask my wife, when I come home, I'm like, <laughs> I am beat. But it is a wilderness for me to step out over there and try to work out to get to somewhere I want to go. I would love my Egypt is sitting on the couch moving the remote control. <laughs> the most I want to lift every day is a fork to my mouth. But to get somewhere, I have to go through some adversity to be a better person. Some of you are gifted, and God is telling you to get out of your Egypt and go into the wilderness, and you're afraid because you're the giants over there. Or let's think about this. Some of you know what's on the other side. You know the promised land. God, you promised me a wife. God, you promised me a husband. God, you promised me a better job. I see it right there. I'm going straight there. And God's saying, I want you to go that way. I want you to go this way. Well, God, it'll take me longer to go that way. I'm protecting you from something. And you wonder, why can't I quite do it the way I want to do? God's protecting you. Look to him for the direction he wants you to go in. Listen to him. You will understand. Yeah, it might not happen for you today. It might not happen for you tomorrow, but it's going to happen for you. You just got to listen to what he tells you. Oh, my God, my own personal story. I had no plans to be in Florida. (laughs) Only reason I wanted to come to Florida was to see Mickey. (laughs) I've been here for 20 years now because God had another plan for me Now, I messed up. I did some stupid things, which is one of the reasons I'm down here. But he's got me here for a purpose. Yeah, South Carolina. I love South Carolina. I talk about it all the time. That's my home. But God has me here for a purpose. God, why you still got me down here in Florida? Hurricanes come down here every year. I don't like hurricanes. That's okay, Chris. I got a place for you to preach. I got a people for you to talk to. Never intended to preach when I come to this church, much less did I intend to come to a white church to preach. (laughs) But God has me here for a reason. And I'm not saying this is a wilderness, but this is a part of my process. It is a part of his plan. So what we have to remember is when we're in our Egypt, it ain't about us. It is about God, and we have to follow his plan, his purpose, and his process. And that means we got to get up and we got to go. We got to separate ourselves. We have to depart. We got to get up and move. Some of you have been sitting in the same place for the same time, a long time. You know, 
Florida was paradise for you. Florida was your promised land. You retired from up north. You brought all your money down here and bought a big piece of property, and you're living and sitting on your, sipping, sipping on your lemonade and swimming in your pool every day, and you don't want to do nothing else. God don't have that plan for you. He don't have that purpose for you. He wants you to get up and move into the wilderness. Coming here every Sunday, maybe every Wednesday night, is not a regular part of practicing worship. Maybe going over to Brooksville and working with some kids might be what he wants you to do. God, I don't know nothing about that. You know, I don't like that. There's giants over there. Maybe going up to home of Sasa, Christ Family Christian Church. Maybe that's the wilderness. Before COVID hit, y'all had a direct arrow to a place that you thought God had given you, and you were ready to take the land. And God stopped everything. He said, no, I want you to take a different route. I want you to wait a little while. God, we don't want to wait. We're ready right now. No. This ain't about you. It's about me. Go to church, meeting in a school. Can't meet no more. School shut down. What you going to do? Put you in the wilderness. Now you got to come up with a plan, and you're looking at God saying, God, what do you want me to do? He says, I want you to practice a daily lifestyle of worship. I want you to look to me, because if you have been covered by my blood and water, and you accept my covenant, and you allow me, my Holy Spirit, to dwell in you, I'm going to let you wander for a little while, but eventually you're going to get to the promised land. So, my question, congregation, where's your promised land? It's not about your better job, your better house, your better car. This is about God's plan. Get off of the Egypt couch. Look to where God wants to send you. Get out of your comfort zone. Look to where God wants to send you because he wants to refine you. And when he refines you, you're going to come out like he wants you, and it's going to be for everybody's benefit better. How are you going to get there? You're going to take the short route? You're going to take the shortcut? How many people took a shortcut and ended up in a ditch in your life? I've taken a few shortcuts and ended up in the wrong place. I've taken a few shortcuts and I ran into some giants. And what happens, it caused you to have to back up and start over again. That's why them people was all over the place. How long is it going to take you to get there? Let me tell you something. Everybody's hourglass ain't the same length of time. God did not promise us tomorrow. All we got is right now. We can't do nothing about what happened yesterday. We can't do nothing about what's going to happen tomorrow. We sit here and plan for this and plan for that. Go out here, no mask, get the COVID. Go out here on 19, get run over by a motorcycle or run over, you know, whatever. You don't have a plan for tomorrow. God has a plan for you. He might give you tomorrow. He might not. But how long is it going to take you to get into your wilderness and start working through what he has for you? What's your Egypt? What's your area of comfort? What is that thing that God wants you to leave alone, to let go of? Could be a person, could be a place, could be a thing, could be a bad habit. Everybody, all of us have our own stories. All of us have a little bit of Egypt that we're holding on to. All of us have a wilderness that we need to go through. All of us are taking different routes and directions. But are you following God's plan for you? Or are you doing your own thing? Are you practicing a lifestyle of worship? You need to get up. You need to depart. You need to separate yourself. You need to depend on God daily, that daily bread, that daily provision. You need to declare his glory for whatever it is you're going through. Not sit and complain. If we depend, if we declare if we depart, then we'll get to our promised land. Guess what? God's waiting on you. 
This is my brand new Father's Day Bible that I got. <laughs> I love books. I was blessed to get this. But I want to read this verse to you, and then we're going to get ready to, to get out of here. We're going to get ready to close. If the band needs to come up, y'all can come on up. But this is what it says. 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. It says, dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord does not delay his promises, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but wanting all to come to repentance. So you're in a couple of places. Most of the time when I talk to the church, most people have accepted Jesus Christ, accepted his covenant, accepted his protection. You've come, but you're sitting in Egypt. You're not getting up and moving. God wants you to move. He's waiting for you to do his will, to do what he wants you to do. But there are a few out there that don't know anything about this covenant, don't know anything about God's protection. And I'm going to tell you the truth. You might think you okay. Egypt ain't good. Egypt will make a slave out of you. Egypt will beat you down. You're going to start out in a good place, and you look around just like the, the people of, of Israel, 400 years, they started out up here, they ended up in slavery. You end up being a slave to that person, a slave to that position, a slave to that job, a slave to that bad habit. And in order for you to get away from that, you're going to have to take a step out. You're going to have to separate yourself. You have to take a step out in that wilderness. It ain't going to be comfortable. It ain't going to be fun. It ain't going to be good. But God is waiting for you because if you make that commitment to him, he'll make a commitment to you. He will make a covenant to you. He will protect you. He will cover you. It might take a little time. You'll go in a certain direction. But I guarantee you, you're going to find your promised land. I want you all to stand up. And if I have a prayer team, I want you all to come. Now, they're going to do a song. This is a little disclaimer. Do not leave after the song because we have to do some church business. So if you remember, do not leave. But more importantly, if you need to take a step, if you need for one of these people to pray for you as you cross the wilderness, if you need to make that commitment to Christ, we can save you with that blood and water today. We have our baptism pool always ready. If you don't know Jesus Christ, tomorrow's not promised. Come to talk to one of these people and make that commitment today. Let's pray as the choir sings this song. Thank you all for your time.